Good morning, everyone, for joining us for our webinar on complete streets and using street design to create healthier communities, sponsored by the National Policy and Legal Analysis Network to Prevent Childhood Obesity, based at, the pub, at Public Health Law and Policy here in Oakland, California. This is Christine Fry, and I will be facilitating today's session. First, a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, if you're having any technical problems, you can contact the amazing Scott Watkins at 510-281-5620, and he's also available via the WebEx chat, uh, which is on the right-hand side of your screen, if you're having any, any technical problems. He'll be available for about the first 20 minutes of the webinar to help you troubleshoot. You're hearing me through your computer speakers, um, and if you have any trouble with the audio quality, um, just make some adjustments to the volume on your speakers um, before contacting Scott. Um, if it's, um, it's really difficult to hear me, um, we do have a call-in number that he can provide to you. Uh, we, um, obviously, since you aren't dialed into a phone, we um, can't take questions from you verbally, but we do have a question and answer panel on the bottom right of your screen uh, where you can submit questions to the panelists throughout the webinar. We'll have about 20 minutes at the end of the session to answer those questions, but you can um, submit them as soon as they come to you so you don't forget them, and we'll make sure to get to as many as we can at the end. Screen, you should be able to see the agenda. Um, after introduction, we'll hear from Paul Zykowski about the benefits and an overview of complete streets. Then um, we'll move into a session of uh, policies that promote complete streets from NPLAN staff attorney Sarah Zimmerman. And then we'll um, hear a great an example uh, from Columbia, Missouri, of a um, street design campaign from Ian Thomas. Finally, we'll close up with a brief presentation from Stephanie Stevens um, on other resources that are available through NPLAN, and then we'll take your questions. Just a brief sense of what NPLAN is. We're funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to provide legal, technical assistance to communities that want to use law and policy to create healthier environments. We model policies and work with advocates and public health officials to understand how the policies might work in their communities. We're prepared to release a pack package of complete streets policies that provide several options to localities and states for using street design to promote walking and biking. The purpose of this webinar is to introduce the public health community to complete streets concepts and how they can improve public health. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce um, Paul Kofsky, who will be introducing you um, more to these complete street concepts. Um, he manages the Local Government Commission's Land Use and Transportation Program and has been director of the Commission's Center for Livable Communities since 1995. During the last eight years, Mr. Zykowski has directed projects in collaboration with the California Department of Health Services and the Robert Johnson Foundation to promote physical activity by improving the design of the built environment. Um, as a frequent presenter at local, regional, and national conferences on a wide range of topics related to land use and transportation. He conducts workshops on pedestrian safety, safe routes to schools, and walkable communities. He's a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners and the Congress for the New Urbanism. He was born in Mexico and is fluent in Spanish. So, hey, Paul. Hey, thank you, Christine. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you here today. I would say good morning, but I guess in some parts of uh, the country it's already afternoon. Um, as soon as we have the PowerPoint up there, um, I'll go ahead and, and start. Uh, the basic thing that I want to cover is really an overview on complete streets, um, why, important, why is it important as an issue, and uh, why we should care. And I think the first uh, set of slides that you'll see uh, in the, as, uh, that follow will really give you a sense for why we should care. And I think that these are uh, symptomatic of the problem that we see in many parts of, of the country. So with that, let me just... Um, I've got control here of the slides. 
Um, it's not working the, um, with my pointer, Christine. Ah, there we go. Okay, excellent. Um, this is an image I use often in my presentations. It was by a friend of mine, Dan Burden. Some of you may know of walkable communities in Missoula, Montana. And uh, it, it shows a street that really uh, was built only for the cars. There is one pedestrian left standing here in Missoula, Montana. Uh, Dan used to joke that he went back uh, three days later and she was still standing there. And of course, we see examples of these types of streets that really were built primarily for the car all over the country. Uh, notice also, and I think this is an important point I want to just make at the, at the outset, that part of what makes this road so bad is the land uses along the road, the way those buildings are placed in relation to the street, the fact they really don't encourage somebody to walk along the street. We have parking lots and so on. So uh, an important part of creating walkable communities it's not only the, the street itself, but also the land uses and site design. Street streets, however, are going to be a very important part in making those places walkable. For example, uh, I like to refer to this street as uh, how streets in many communities work as uh, traffic sewers. We've created streets that are so ugly that no building or house wants to front onto it. Um, we put children in peril if they have to walk along these streets or cross them. We have blocks that are so long that these poor folks uh, who didn't get from the cafeteria to the motel across the street have to put them in harm's uh, way just to get across the street. It's not feasible or reasonable to expect that they would walk to an intersection maybe a quarter or a half mile away to cross the street. Sections that are so big that uh, instead of having, and you can barely see the walk, don't walk here, instead of uh, having that sign, we probably should have a sign that says on your marks, get set, go. Keep in mind, by the way, that this not only impacts the ability of people to walk, and it also negatively impacts the motorists because we now have created such big intersections that every time we have a signal cycle, we're going to have to hold back cars longer and longer. So there's a real win-win in complete streets, not just with respect to pedestrians and bicyclists, but also to creating streets that work better for motorists as well. And some of these, of course, sidewalks have just disappeared. Here's an example of one community in the Bay Area where they lost their sidewalk. Uh, if someone wants to walk along here, they can't. Trent is often very difficult to access. Uh, you'll notice there is a pad here for Trent user, but no way to get to it because there's no sidewalk. Uh, example of a transit stop in this case, uh, crowding the sidewalk, um, not the kind of emphasis we want to place on transit where we want to have good shelters and space for uh, forcing the bus to wait. This is taken just down from the school. We talk about how important children are to us. And in many communities, we don't even have the basic infrastructure of a sidewalk. This happens to be in an urban area of Sacramento County. It's not a, a rural area. But access for folks with disabilities uh, here, we've got a beautiful ramp on this side of the street. But notice there's no ramp on the opposite side. So a person crossing here won't be able to get back up on the sidewalk. It's a complete street. A complete street really is a safe street that's comfortable and convenient for travel by car, foot, bicycle, and transit. It really is a street that works for everybody and built correctly for all use. Here's a, a large intersection in the Colorado. You'll notice there's a trail coming up to the intersection, uh, quite a few lanes of traffic, and yet we've designed it as pedestrians, bicyclists, cars can all get across the street safely. And still building intersections like this. This, I'm not to pick on Illinois, but this is a recently completed uh, road expansion in Illinois with pedestrians on both sides of the road. And you may notice there's a poor pedestrian trying to get across the street, uh, you know, in, in a very perilous uh, location. It's just a difficult, tough street to cross, and no effort has been made to make it better or easier for pedestrians to get across. Now, uh, the reason we emphasize the need for complete streets policy is we want to make sure that as either new roads are built or roads are maintained, that we really plan and build and design the entire right-of-way to be uh, operated for all users. So when we a situation like this, where people are walking along this road, we want to sure that there's actually a sidewalk, as we see in this image, for those people to be accommodated. Complete policies really provide for all these different users, pedestrians, bicyclists, transit, motorists, trucks of all ages and abilities. 
and want this complete streets policy to make the needs of all users the default for everyday transportation planning practices. We don't want to have special pots of money to do this. We want to make it the, the default way that any traffic engineer or any community that designs maintains the streets. We all don't want to just focus on individual streets. We're really talking about a complete network of roads that serve all users. And that can sometimes be controversial because, as you see in this image, in the last 50, 60 years, we've built developments with very poor connectivity between different users. So it's sometimes very, very complicated for people, even if the, the sidewalks and these uh, in the streets in these communities had good sidewalks, to from one place to another because we've now lost those connections between, say, the shopping and the, and the uh, homes or the school and the homes, and we create a condition where people have to drive everywhere. So the network of streets and roads is also very important. We want to have a complete streets policy to shift transportation investments so they create better streets now. We don't want to think of, of, of these um, policies as being something that will uh, require special funding in the future to occur. We want to see any time a road is maintained, upgraded, changes are made to it that we accommodate all users. We all recognize that when we have to go and retrofit a street, as we in this image, it can cost more than if we get it right the first time. There's still a lot of communities in our country that are building new neighborhoods, and we're sure we don't have to go back you know, 10, 20 years later to retrofit those streets. We know from surveys that have been done around the country that most Americans would rather drive less and walk more. Uh, we've seen in the last few years, especially with gas prices rising, that transit is growing faster than population or driving. And know that about one-third of Americans don't drive. That's a, a figure that often shocks people. Uh, but think about uh, the 21% of Americans, that there are 21% of Americans over 65 that don't or cannot drive any longer. And so children under 16, that's about a third of our population. So we also have to remember that low-income Americans that can't afford to drive. There's a significant portion of our population that has to be able to get around by walking, bicycling, taking transit. We all know that Americans in surveys want complete streets. And when we asked uh, folks uh, in surveys around the country how they would like to allocate transportation funding, this is what they told us. 37% for roads, 4% for public transportation, 27% for bicycle and walking. And people are shocked when they see this image, which shows that we only spend about 1% of our transportation funds on bike and walking and 20% on public transit. The rest goes to roads and basically to moving cars. Another national poll that was done last year by AARP found 47% of older Americans are pretty unsafe to cross a major street near their home. 56% wanted strong support of these types of complete streets policies. So it's uh, no surprise that ARP is one of the strong uh, organizations involved in advocating for complete streets. The benefits, I'll talk about the benefits for different sectors of the population. Obviously, for older Americans, we've got that 21% of older Americans that do not drive. We've got 50% of non drivers who stay at home on a given day because they lack transportation options. So we're really impacting the, the ability of seniors to be socially engaged, to be active to be physically active and, and stay healthy. And 54% of older Americans living in inhospitable neighborhoods say they'd walk and ride more often if things improved. From a health standpoint, I know there's a lot of folks from the health community on this call. We know that over the last decades, we've got a serious uh, ep epidemic of obesity. We move without moving because we're moving in our cars. and Sometimes we're not moving at all because we're stuck in traffic. 60% uh, of adults now are at risk for diseases associated with overweight and activity, and we see the list here. So it's a serious concern and reason why Robert Woodson Foundation is so focused on this issue. The benefits of activity are, are obvious. Residents are more likely to walk in a neighborhood with sidewalks. Cities with more bike lanes have seen higher levels of bicycling. If you build it, people will come and use those. And an interesting fact that one-third of regular transit users meet minimum daily physical activity requirement, which is 30 minutes of, of walking during their commute. So already by, by taking transit, we're in an environment where folks are staying healthier. And this also illustrates the problem very clearly. Uh, countries like ours, where the percentage of walking, biking, and transit trips have a much higher prevalence of obesity 
to other countries where we see more people walking, biking, and taking transit, and we see the obesity prevalence drop. The same benefits are also important. Uh, we know from uh, studies that have been done that sidewalks reduce pedestrian crashes by 8%, a significant reduction. Medians and roads that help people cross the street reduce crashes 40%. Road diets, where we reduce a road and take out a lane, can reduce crashes by 29%. Often we're going from four lanes to three. We get a reduction in crashes. We also get a slower street and need one to cross. Count signals, which give more information to the pedestrian, all have been found to reduce crashes by 25%. Intersections, which is often where the conflict between pedestrians and uh, motorists uh, is most, uh, most likely to occur, can be designed for pedestrians to reduce their risk by 28%. And we know how to design these correctly. Obviously, there are benefits for people with disabilities. We provide improved mobility for folks who, may, who cannot drive and the reduced need for expensive paratransit service. In Maryland, for example, they found that a year of paratransit service for a daily commuter cost them about $38,000. Making transit stop accessible cost between 7000 and 58000 Of course, once that transit stop is accessible, it's for years to come, as opposed to the annual cost we have to pay for paratransit. Other benefits to the environment, fewer emissions as we get people to drive less and less, less noise pollution, less wear and tear on our roads, less need to widen roads. As with reduced traffic, we also may, may get people to uh, walk more. Um, one thing to keep in mind, is that 50% of trips in metropolitan areas are less than three miles. So that's a perfect distance for someone to get on a bicycle and get there in five, ten minutes. 20% of trips are less than one mile. Those are trips that could easily be done by walking or biking, and yet 65% of those trips are now taken by an automobile. Also, There are also benefits for economic activity. We know from uh, work that's been done across the country, when a street is rebuilt, when we add bike lanes, when we improve conditions for parking, we create uh, better uh, conditions for economic activity. Home values go up, we revise commercial areas, and people can leave their car at home now. This is actually a street in Port Oregon that was put on a road diet where they added in the bicycle lanes. Also benefits for individual wallets. Creation in many homes is the second largest expense, and we've seen in, in recent years the costs rise. Complete streets really do allow people to leave their cars at home. So how streets change the built environment? Well, this is an image showing a before and after of a street that was put on a road diet. You'll notice uh, the before shows a four-lane road with no bicycle lanes. The after shows a three-lane with a two-way left turn lane and bicycle lane. So that's an example of uh, a change to the built environment that was accomplished through complete streets. We can section design from an intersection like that looks like this that would be very difficult for a senior to try to cross to one that looks more like this, where we have a good meet up place to place as we cross the street and make it easier for pedestrian to get across. We can change bicycling from a perilous situation like this one where poor bicyclist is just straddling the line uh, on the edge of the road to a situation like this, where with a comfortable bicycle lane now, even a teenager feels comfortable and the parents feel comfortable letting a teenager ride their bike. We transit from a situation like this, where we have a pad but no way to access it, to a transit stop that really works well for the transit user, with a good filter, with a good place to cross the street after we get off the bus. We also change accessibility. In any project we do, we have to comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act, so we can go in a situation like this to one like this where we put in good ramps and place for folks with disabilities to get from the sidewalk down to the street and across the street. There's also sometimes of trails, how to complete streets relate to trails. And we like, we like to point out that streets obviously provide access to trails. If we, with, if we, when we have complete streets and trails, we can form a comprehensive non-motorized network. And we'll find in some cases the complete streets can take the pressure off overcrowded, overcrowded trails. Now folks that might have used the trail can be comfortable on streets. One thing I emphasize is that complete streets is not a designed prescription. It's a mandate for immediate retrofit, not a silver bullet. There are other initiatives that must be addressed if we want to create more walkable, bicycle-friendly communities. 
I mentioned at the outset, land use, site design, and so on, uh, but complete is a big help, and that's why we're so focused on it these days. So what does Street look like? Well, there isn't a one-size-fits-all prescription. Uh, it doesn't mean that every street has sidewalks, bike lanes, and transit. There's no magic formula. This street that we see here is actually a great street in North America that we're for, as you see, bicyclists, pedestrians, commercial activity, transit, cars can park, and yet you'll see there's very little engineering on the street. There's actually no lane markers. Uh, a few signs, but because the speeds are slow and there's a lot of things happening on the, on the street, there are a lot of pedestrians there already, it just works. And just adding one thing to a street can make it a complete street. In this case, in Portland, and adding this uh, Crown Island made it possible for a safe route to school project, really completed the street and made it work for everybody. In real often a paved shoulder is the space that we need to provide for pedestrians and bicyclists. It's not possible to build uh, sidewalks in uh, rural areas where development is diverse, but a good shoulder can provide space for bicyclists and pedestrians to get around in those communities. If we get into urban areas, obviously a busy multimodal roadway like this one, the bike lane is very important. We have to make sure we accommodate all the different users. That routes, having a good bus stop, bus shelter, a good way to access that shelter is going to be also very important. This is often what people will, will come to when they think of a, of a complete street, sort of a suburban thoroughfare with multiple lanes and bicycle lanes. Uh, yes, this is a, a good, a good uh, design, although I would point out that most people would probably not want to live on a street like this that probably carries a lot of traffic. In red area is a skinny street, a narrow street that keeps cars moving slowly in a work as a complete street with a good sidewalk and places to cross. And the examples of complete streets with, in communities with very low volumes of traffic and very low speeds of people just being able to use the street itself to get around. This is a street that works very effectively that way because there's not much traffic on it. Historic streets are also areas where we can see complete streets. Uh, we sometimes uh, have some problems with not having enough space to do everything we want on the street, but again, if the speeds are slow, we have a, a decent sidewalk, those streets will work. Now, design guides tell us, well, the Association of, uh, of Highway and Transportation Officials and their Bible for traffic engineers tell us that sidewalks are integral parts of streets. They're not something added to streets. They're part of the street. They all, in the uh, Green Book, tell us that shoulders are desirable on urban materials. Well, bike lanes are shoulders reserved for bicycle use. So the, the design of traffic engineers really do support complete streets. I often find when we work in communities that the station engineers and plan know how to build good streets. They're simply seeking permission, support, and direction from the leadership and the community to, to build those streets. Very big on context-sensitive solutions. This is an issue that's uh, been in play for several years now. Uh, context-sensitive and, and complete streets, the point I want to make is that context sensitivity is focused primarily on the surrounding physical context, the land use environment, nature itself, which is very important as well to come streets, but there hasn't been as much focus on the users of the street or the road. And of course, complete streets focuses on the people, the bicyclists, the pedestrians, the transit users that are more just the context. So again, complete streets are sensitive to the community, they serve adjacent land uses, and they serve all who potentially will use that street. I'll get into much on what's happening with national policy, but I just want to, want to mention that we have over 100 communities now that have adopted complete streets policies around the country. We have a federal bill that's also uh, that's also introduced last year. Uh, you can do read on that online. And a large percentage of complete streets workshops now are being sponsored by health organizations. As far as funding, as I pointed out earlier, we're really about using existing resources differently. And there's the whole alphabet soup of different funding sources for transportation that really support and can be used for completing the street. FIT funding will be important. It's not necessary to get started. We really can work with what we have available. So complete streets policy ensures that all the users of the system, uh, pedestrians, bicyclists, transit users, as well as children, all the individuals and individuals with disabilities are able to travel safely and conveniently on streets and highways. Very straightforward policy. I want by just referring people to the uh, National Complete Streets Coalition's website, which has some great fact sheets, monthly news, policy examples, uh, also 
also uh, run some Complete Streets implementation workshops. I'm one of the uh, facilitators of those workshops, and there will be a best practices manual. It's a resource, and I encourage you to take a look at it, and also to join the coalition. With that, I will stop. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. That was a great overview of the issue. Um, I'm now going to take back the presenter role. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes before we move to the next presentation. Uh, one is um, the slides and a recording of this presentation will be available on our website, nplan.org, tomorrow. And we'll be sending out an email uh, to everybody who participated, who listened in on the call, um, and even those who just registered but didn't participate, um, when those resources are available. Um, the second is a reminder to use the Q&A box throughout the presentation. It's um, in the bottom right-hand corner of your window, and you can submit questions to the presenters as they come to you. So um, I'd like to introduce Sarah Zimmerman, the NPLAN attorney, staff attorney who's been working on our um, Complete Streets model policies over the last year. And I'd just like to note that it was raining today and Sarah rode her bike to work. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> she believes in this um, and doesn't just work on it. Sarah, take it away. Everybody. My name is Sarah Zimmerman, and I'm a staff attorney here at the at N Plan, and we're a project of public health law and policy, as Christine mentioned before. And I'm going to talk to you today about the policies that we've developed. I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about the role of policy. I'm going to explain what policy is and why policy is important. Then move into talking about the model policies that we've developed and talk about our approach, the different types of policies we developed, and how to use the models that we have. Before I get started with I wanted to just start out with a quick personal story. Um, so as Christine mentioned, I ride my bike to work, and I started that last spring, and I've been getting lots of exercise ever since I started it. It saved me money. It saved me time. Um, but about a month ago, I was riding my bike home on one of the less safe stretches of my ride, and I got knocked off my bicycle by a careless driver. And I was very lucky. I... I just got some blizz and my bicycle was fine. But it really brought home to me the fact that it takes quite a bit of daring to engage in active transportation on incomplete streets. And so if we want kids to be safe and parents to feel safe letting kids incorporate exercise into their daily activities and their daily transportation, we need to be sure that we're making our streets complete. Let's jump into the topic. What is a model policy? A model policy is a legal tool, and the legal tool can be anything from a resolution or a law or a zoning code or a contract. It's a legal tool that provides a strong general starting place for a community's policy needs. So it's not tailored to a particular community, and it hasn't gone through a political process in any particular community that may have resulted in, in compromises, but instead it provides a really good general starting place for a community thinking about adopting a certain kind of policy. Model policy is also a living document, so we're still learning a lot about how policy can help support healthy communities. And a model policy, so as we're learning about that, we are adjusting and amending our model policies to really account for those lessons from the field. A model policy is also a set of questions that a community can use to think through the approach that it wants to take to a, a given policy goal. And not all communities will want to follow the approach that's laid out in any given model policy, and they might want to adopt all the features that are set forth in the model policy. But they should think through all of the issues that are presented and make a conscious decision about whether or not they want to incorporate those into how their community approaches the issue in question. So how provided that general definition, I want to talk to you a little bit about what our approach here at Public Health Law and Policy is to model policy. There's three really key criteria to, uh, to develop model policy. And um, the first is that a model policy needs to be legally sound. As a lawyer, this is near and dear to my heart. Um, so we need to first make sure, as a very fundamental thing, that a model policy isn't running foul of any of the big legal doctrines that are out there, the Constitution, federal or state laws, or legal doctrines that have been developed by the 
courts. And then also, in, as part of making sure that a policy is legally sound, we need to make sure that we've been very thoughtful about the language that we use and that um, internally the, the policy is tight, the word choice has been careful, and it's consistent, and that we've accounted for all of the, the things that a court's going to expect to see in that policy or that the policy needs to have to do what it is intended to do in a community. A policy also is a strong policy. And this is something interesting that kind of distinguishes between a model policy and a sample policy. So you may often hear, like, oh, New York has just adopted a really strong, amazing policy about a certain issue. And we certainly want to look at sample policies that are out there, and they indeed be strong and wonderful policies. Any policy that gets adopted has gone through some kind of political process, and it usually results in some sort of changes that are different from what advocates were initially advocating for. And a model policy has the luxury of not having to go through that process. It prevents a strong starting place so that you're not accidentally incorporating compromises into your community that, that don't necessarily, aren't necessarily necessary in your community. At the same time, a model policy is also a realistic policy. It's not idealistic or naive. It's strong, but it takes into account where we really are right now in terms of the political situation of our communities. When we develop model policy, we go through a specific process. And we first start by serving all the existing policies that are out there. And we analyze them and consider what are the strong parts of them, and we pluck those out and, um, and think about it and incorporate them into the policy that we're taking. And also analyze the weaker parts of them and think about the considerations that went into that, those, those provisions. We engage in analysis of the legal issues. And then our, our, our model policies go through extensive expert review and revision. And we have input into them from experts in a variety of different fields that touch upon the area in question. We also include a couple of features routinely in our model policies that are intended to make them easier for users to, um, to use and to effectively implement. And the first feature is that we include comments in these that are not intended to be adopted into the, the, the community actually adopts, but are intended to explain some of the important provisions of the policy. And try as we might to use simple and, um, and meaningful language that everybody can use, legal documents often end up being loaded with some technical terms and, um, and can just be confusing, and there's no, there's no avoiding that. So we try and use these comments to explain what's going on when that happens. We also include um, notions that make it clear where a community can tailor the model policy to its own needs, because we understand that just because we've developed a model policy doesn't mean that different communities aren't going to need it to be a little bit different for them. That's the important. Policy is crucial to making lasting change in communities. And these are some of the ways that policies do that. Policies engage community members and local leaders. And the process of advocating for a policy often really increases the commitment of, of local leaders to a concept and ensures that its ultimate implementation is much more thorough and rigorous. Policy also institutionalize change so that if the change in the leadership in a community, that you don't get a change in, in that policy as well, but it remains, it remains there. And policies ensure consistent implementation. As Paul was discussing, there's a lot of different users that are, are um, part of who we're thinking about when we think about complete streets, people with disabilities, bicyclists, pedestrians. Um, and it's possible that the needs of some of those individuals are going to get forgotten if they're not in the room, unless there's a policy that makes sure that we think about all of them each time we're, do we're doing a transportation project. And the policies allow for enforcement. Having you that basic introduction to how we think about policy, I'm going to move on to talking about the complete streets policies that we've developed. I'll talk about the approach that's taken by those policies, introduce you to the different types of policies that we developed, and talk a bit about how to use these models. First off, what is the approach that we've taken in developing these policies? There are two main ideas to it. First, the policies are flexible. They provide significant flexibility to communities 
and leave decisions about what features are going to be put on what streets up to communities. And they're also forward-looking. They're focused on streets and the planned or reduction of streets rather than going retrofitting all the existing streets. This approach is a response to two challenges, and Paul already did a really thorough job of explaining what these challenges are. But in essence, it's the fact that the of our country are very different from each other. And in fact, the streets in any given town or city are very different from each other. They range from, you know, they may range from busy roads to very bucolic, small, winding roads. And there's many different local factors to, to balance and consider. And because all streets don't need to look the same, we need to make sure that any policy that we adopt allows communities that flexibility. Other challenge is the challenge of funding. And retrofitting streets is expensive, and any kind of street project is really quite expensive. And so the forward-looking approach that Paul described that is part of these policies ensures that any costs that are associated with complete streets features are incorporated into the basic costs of building streets and retrofitting streets. It's really how it should be, so that we don't need a separate pot of money to, um, to make our streets complete, but that we're just continuously done on a forward-looking basis. So how do policies actually work? We're into some of the nitty-gritty legal language here. So I hope that um, they bear with me and, um, and think about these words, because words really are important in the law. So the policies have two key features. The first key feature is that they establish a new approach to street design and transportation planning. They basically intended to, to encourage and require agencies within a community to, to, to change the way that they do business, to think just about how to move the most cars the fastest, to really think about their mission as being making the streets safe for everybody. Let me use the language that the policies use to require that. Agencies shall make complete streets practices a routine part of everyday operations shall approach every transportation project as an opportunity to improve streets and the transportation network for all users, and shall work in coordination with other departments, agencies, and jurisdictions to achieve complete streets. The second key feature of the policy is, is not simply that, that important culture change that we talked about in the first key feature, but it requires a real change in how communities actually build and renovate streets. So the second feature requires that the needs of each user be accounted for in every new street and new project on an existing street. And that's the language that, that the policies do use to do that. Street projects shall incorporate complete streets infrastructure sufficient to enable reasonably safe travel along and across the right of way for each category of users. This really requires a very significant change in the way that communities are accustomed to doing business when it comes to streets. It requires that every time a street project, and that includes both new streets and, and renovation of existing streets, every time there's a, a street project, structure needs to be incorporated that makes those streets reasonably safe for all users. And I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the examples of weaker language that we found in a few of the existing policies so that you can understand a little bit better the process that we go through in developing strong and legally sound policy and what that really means. And I caution you that this may sound uh, kind of overly fidgety or overly picky and oriented towards the exact words. But as I mentioned before, Words are really important when it comes to legal policy, and, and the choice of the right words can make a big difference in the implementation and ultimate effectiveness of a given policy. So, for example, a few of the policies that are out there call for consideration of the needs of all users every time there's a street project. And this, on first blush, sounds like a great idea. I mean, we want to make sure that the needs of all users are considered when we do a street project. Um, but in fact, this language is, is, is pretty weak when it comes down to thinking about what's actually required by it. Um, a community that, that wasn't all that interested in changing how it did business could consider the needs of all users and decide that it wasn't going to bother to account for them in how it actually built its street. 
And so that's something we really need to be aware of. Words don't always have the same um, meaning in a legal document as they might in the, when we're just sitting around and talking at a table about this. Another example of language that's found out there in a few of the existing policies is a requirement that every street project must provide appropriate accommodation for all users. And this has a different potential problem. Um, the word accreditation is one that has a really specific meaning in the context of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which requires reasonable accommodation for, for people with disabilities. And there have been hundreds, if not thousands, of cases out there deciding what exactly is meant by accommodation, where accommodations are necessary, and um, there's a really evolved legal doctrine around that word. And so it no longer has just its ordinary dictionary definition when it's used in a policy. And all of those ideas that are related to the Americans with Disabilities Act are not something that we really want to incorporate into this complete streets policy. It's not a guarantee that a court or anyone interpreting a, a complete streets policy with that word would interpret it in light of the Americans with Disabilities Act, particularly because we are addressing the needs of people with disabilities in, in the complete streets policy. It is quite possible. And so that, you know, that provides you with a little bit more understanding of what we think about when we develop the language in a model policy. So described, the, the complete streets, the language of that feature really requires a pretty significant change and is quite demanding. And because it's so demanding, in order to provide that flexibility to communities that we talked about, there needs to be a pretty rigorous and meaningful exceptions process as well. And policies provide several exceptions. First, by that where bicyclists or pedestrians are barred by law, complete streets infrastructure does not need to be put in. And this applies to situations like the interstate highway system, in where the cost of putting in complete streets in structure would be disproportionate to the cost of the project that's planned. Um, the infrastructure, a community can choose to, to not include that infrastructure. Finally, there's a very broad exception, and that, that exception provides that if the infrastructure would be unreasonable or inappropriate in light of the scope of the project, that a community can choose to exclude it. And that might come up where um, a street want, needed the flexibility to not have to enlarge a street to put in a bike lane or a sidewalk, because so would destroy a local historic structure or would destroy habitat for an endangered species. And that flexibility, a community might really be um, be in a hard spot. So the exceptions are very broad. And in order to rein them in and make sure that the spirit of complete street policy is, is really um, respected, we've provided for significant accountability as well. These exceptions can only be exercised where there's written approval by a senior manager. That could be someone like the director of the public works department. Um, the community chooses who that individual is. In addition, they can only be exercised if there's data and documentation supporting the need for the exception. And so these accountability provisions provide a detailed paper trail that can help advocates ensure that city officials are adhering to the spirit of the complete streets policy. The policies also contain a number of other provisions that are not as crucial or central as the two key features that I've just discussed, but that really help make sure that the policy is thoroughly implemented in the community and think about some of the connections that need to be made in doing so. And as a result, these policies are somewhat longer and more detailed than some of the existing policies that are out there. Community, a community does not need to include all of these, these additional provisions if they don't seem appropriate for your community needs, but they really help to ensure thorough implementation of the complete streets ideas. Some of these provisions include things like requiring agencies to revise existing plans, policies, and street design templates so that they're accounting for the needs of all users, requiring that the community collect data on who's using the streets and establish some goals and benchmarks around increasing the use of streets by pedestrians and bicyclists and people with disabilities, and the number of additional provisions that I won't discuss in detail right now. As I, just, as I mentioned, we have some complete streets policies that are actually about to be released, and we will send you an email. They're probably going to come out in the next three or four weeks, and we'll send you an email with a link to where they're available on our website as soon as they, they are released. And I'll quickly talk you through what they are. We have some small resolutions that a community can adopt, one both for a local at the local level and another that's appropriate 
for adoption by a state or by a county. We have developed some complete streets laws, and we have one that's a local law and one that's a state law. We developed language that can be inserted into a comprehensive plan to support complete streets, and we developed some findings that go along with the, the resolutions of the laws and explain the factual and legal reasons, provide factual and legal support for the adoption of that policy by the community. What type of policy should your community adopt? In whether you want to adopt a law or a resolution, that determination is going to depend upon how committed your community is to the issue and, and, um, and what kind of political power you have. So adopting law is generally a stronger approach. It's going to ensure that you get more thorough implementation of the policy in question, and it's going to potentially be a little bit harder to do. Where resolution is more of an aspirational kind of document, and it's quite possible that you can get your, your local council people or, um, or other policymakers to adopt a resolution more easily than to adopt a law. Thinking about whether you want to work on getting language for a comprehensive plan in your community, you're going to think about a couple of things. First, comprehensive plans are long-range planning documents, and they're usually revised on a regular basis. So if visions are coming up in your community, that may be a really good opportunity for you to advocate for getting, getting complete streets language put into your comprehensive plan. Language in your comprehensive plan can also really support the, the, a complete streets law that you may have passed because it provides an opportunity to make sure that a lot of different connections and agencies in your community are thinking about ways that they can support complete streets and ways that complete streets can support the work that they're doing. There's three things that I want you to remember as you're using a model policy. The needs and conditions may call for adding to or subtracting from the models. And if you have special things going on in your community that mean that you want to incorporate additional ideas in or that some of the features in the policies are not appropriate for your community, the model is intended to be revised in, in just that way. Additionally, your political power and the political will of your local leadership may require compromises as you go through the political process. And that is just part of the reality of, of getting a policy passed. Sure. Um, and just go ahead and do that if need be. It's really crucial that as you go through the process of revising these or even as, um, as you're just attempting to understand how exactly these policies would play out in your community, that you consult with a local lawyer or a city attorney, somebody who's licensed to practice law in your state. But you want to make sure that the model really reflects any specific um, aspects of state law that affect how it works. And also, because transportation regimes differ considerably from state to state, you want to make sure that the model really fits in well with the way transportation is, is um, regulated in your state and in your community. In our models have gone through extensive legal research and review, and we believe that they provide a really strong starting place for a community that's interested in exploring and getting to complete streets. But the best policy for your community is going to be a policy that meets your local community needs and has enough political traction that it can be passed and implemented. So then that you modify these model policies in conjunction with a local attorney to make sure that they meet your needs and help you accomplish complete streets in your community. Feel free to get in touch with me if you have any questions that aren't answered by this webinar. And we hope that these streets help you make your these policies help you make your streets more complete. All right, thank you, Sarah. Get up there for just one second while I note that um, your questions will be answered at the end of the session. Uh, we'll have about 15 to 20 minutes to take your questions. Um, so those of you who are confused about when that was going to happen, uh, it'll be at the end. So now um, I'm to change us over to Ian Thomas. Just get slides up. Ian is the executive director and co-founder of the PedNet Coalition of Columbia, Missouri. 
TNET's mission is to create an active transportation network in Colombia through policy action and community engagement programs. From 2000 to 2004, he led a campaign to amend local street design standards to include pedestrian, bicycle, and wheelchair facilities. In 2005, he developed and launched a walking school bus program, which has now grown to include more than 400 children at 10 schools. He's a member of the Safe Routes to Schools Committee and is on the board of America Walk. Very much, Christine, and welcome, everybody. <clears throat> um, I uh, I see the little green uh, flashing thing on my telephone, so I guess everybody's hearing me. And just see if I'm controlling the slides. I'm only controlling them on my computer, so I hope I with everybody. <clears throat> well, I want to thank the previous speakers, um, Paul Dara, for firstly a very good um, overview of the concept of complete streets and the benefits. Completely, it's not just for pedestrians and cyclists, but all road users, and really for a, uh, a great society and a great transportation infrastructure to think about all of those different uses. Uh, and, and Sarah, for her very technical uh, analysis and, and explanation of, of what uh, um, is required to actually make complete streets come to pass in communities. Um, I'm going to give a, a, a third perspective now, which is very much from the um, grassroots advocates, um, and tell the story of a campaign that um, a, a large group of us and in Columbia, Missouri, uh, the early part of the last decade, I guess, 2000 to 2004, to change the rules on how the streets were built in our town uh, to open them up for pedestrians, cyclists, and uh, people in wheelchairs, which prior to that time really uh, had a great deal of difficulty getting around as was illustrated uh, several times in Paul's um, presentation. Um, the Iran really also marked the formation of our organization, the PedNet Coalition. Uh, we, we continue to exist uh, promoting walking and bicycling and also working on advocacy projects to continue to create a, a safer and more appealing place for uh, people to walk and bike and move towards our vision of a much more multimodal transportation system in our city. And we also um, consult and deliver workshops uh, around the state of Missouri and also to some extent around the country uh, uh, in trying to help other communities to replicate some of what we've achieved through a variety of different approaches. Um, our, our overall approach to achieve a, um, a walkable, bicycle-friendly, wheelchair-accessible community is in two parts, and we think very much um, at our work in these two separate categories. On the one hand, we have community-based programs where we reach out to the community on the individual and population level and encourage uh, people to do their behaviors and to, uh, to, to start walking to school uh, start uh, bicycling to work, um, using active transportation to get around. Uh, and on the other hand, um, we have uh, work where we, uh, oh, there we go, that was the slot, one I went, meant to do when I talked about that. And the other uh, ha uh, sort of side of the coin is the uh, policy advocacy work, where we work to change um, uh, policy laws and um, public uh, agency practices that um, often very more strongly control the way people behave than purely the way they wish they would behave, um, especially where they control infrastructure design. We very much see these two um, components as uh, mutually reinforcing each other. We can bring a, a walk school bus program in an area where it, it maybe is just about safe to walk if the kids have an uh, adult um, supervising that walk and seeing them safely across the street. But through that program, we can... Um, develop advocates in the form of the parents, the school teachers, and the children themselves, who will then call their city council people and basically take part in an advocacy campaign to ask for that sidewalk system to be or crosswalk to be sort of put in a particular place. So this is a, a, our general approach to behavior change, to, um, to, to um, um, improving a community for walking and bicycling through these uh, two mutually reinforcing strategies of programs and policy advocacy. Um, 
very briefly, um, the PedNet Coalition um, conducts a tremendous number of different programs. There's a walking school bus in the top right there, a uh, bicycle a skills class in the lower left. We do a tremendous amount of um, educational and encouragement work on bicycles with children and also adults. Uh, we have programs that focus on particular neighborhoods. We have fo uh, programs that focus particularly on commuters by working through the employers and the businesses to encourage and, and just really try and get at this behavior change uh, any way we can. Um, but my presentation now is going to concentrate on our uh, Complete Streets uh, cane, which, as I mentioned, um, uh, took place from 2000 to 2004. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the kind of main um, aspects of that campaign. Um, I'm going to then use this as a uh, ting opportunity for uh, those of you who want to run similar campaigns and, and try to share lessons learned and help you maybe um, uh, make the right decisions along the way of, uh, of your campaign. Uh, maybe uh, achieve your goal in a shorter time than, than we did, because four years is certainly a long time. Um, but this was um, uh, the, the, the type of uh, infrastructure that prompted um, a group of us to form the PedNet Coalition. Um, initially, we, we in, um, showed the vision of a well-connected bicycle pedestrian wheelchair accessible uh, system with community members and build up a lot of support for that change. And we also spent a lot of time Ending um, public meetings in which new roads were being planned. In this early part of the decade, there was tremendous growth going on in Columbia, Missouri, and new streets and residential streets and residential streets were being um, designed and going through a public process at quite a rate. And we found ourselves continually trying to keep up with these meetings and make the case to the elected city council, the Planning zoning commission, and city staff working on these projects and their contractors um, that they should be considering pedestrians, cyclists, and wheelchair users. Um, and it was a bit of a losing battle because uh, we're all volunteers, and um, it was a tremendous, tremendously um, time-consuming process to keep up with all of this. And realized. Uh, eventually, that the trick was going to be to change the policy, because if you change the policy, the uh, individual projects have to follow the new policy, at least they're supposed to. Let's say that you can take your eye off the ball after the policy has been changed. It's necessary to monitor once, once a, a public policy has been changed to liking, monitor that it is still being adhered to. But life becomes a lot easier. So um, that was campaign really started. Um, and um, at the time the PedNet Coalition was growing, it was, it was obvious that we wanted to make a major change to the way that our city uh, was designing and building its infrastructure. It was going to take large-scale public support. And this, um, this was very much in keeping what we were already doing just to grow our general vision of a walkable, bikeable community by uh, attending a tremendous number of public events, community events, early festivals, other community festivals, Festivals. Columbia uh, holds a tremendous number every great opportunities to get out and meet the public in a setting where um, you can present your um, your your uh, um, case, your uh, point of interest, and we have the opportunity to basically sign up a, uh, a a petition, sign members to a petition. We call them members of our organization, and over a period of uh, well, the campaign three or four years. Uh, about 5,000 people in Columbia, a town of about 100,000, signed a petition to say supported our mission of creating a walkable, bikeable city. Um, uh, and, and there's probably a lesson here because we uh, took all their names and we put them on our website, and they're still there. The number has now grown to uh, close to 7,000. Um, and uh, we refer to them as members, although there's no membership dues as such. They're really people that support our mission. But I think it showed people People, the real strength of support in the community for this idea of a walkable, bikeable community. And the Street Design Standards campaign um, very um, neatly fit into what we were already doing as, a, as an organization just to build our membership and our support. Um, and this became the focus of our efforts for the next few years. Uh, I'll make a quick mention. Uh, of terminology here. Uh, I've been referring to what we did as, the, as our street design standards campaign. It was also, we talked about model street.
street to the standards back in those days as well. And at that time, uh, I don't think any of us had heard of the term complete streets. And I'm not sure when that, where that, that co- the term was coined, but I think I first heard of it in uh, 2005, 2006, after we had completed our campaign and the connection and thought, well, what a great, great term that is. Uh, but at the time, um, it was not certainly not known to us. Uh, so there was a uh, eventually a um, public process, uh, which I'm going to describe when I get to a slide in a minute that shows the timeline, uh, which led to a, a, a long series, uh, well over a year's worth of public meetings at different levels with various public bodies, the Planning and Zoning Commission, the Bicycle and Pedestrian Commission, and the full city council. Uh, there was a number of private meetings with stakeholders to build support or maybe to work out differences. Um, so um, one of our key tactics with the public meetings was to bring a large contingent of people that supported our position. So our organization's uh, membership, we had collected email addresses all along. Um, uh, we had a, a monthly email newsletter, and we were able to uh, alert people to an important uh, public uh, meeting um, made at the Planning and Zoning Commission level and encourage people to come uh, wear their PedNet t-shirts and all of those white t-shirts there say PedNet on them and that was uh, known to the members of the committee and they could see that the chamber was full of people uh, who supported a particular position and then many of these people spoke during the public comment um, uh, opportunity which uh, our local council and commission meetings always provide. So taking advantage of the democratic avenues, building large public support by educating the community and convincing people of the benefits of, of this change in, um, in design standards and also um, uh, motivating them sufficiently to actually give up a couple of hours on an evening of their private time to become an advocate can be incredibly helpful because it shows the elected legislators who generally do want to uh, make the kind of decisions that the community wants if they believe that there's a good and fair public process going on, uh, convince them that there's widespread public support for this. Um, another great tool for doing this is media advocacy. Um, and again, we're fortunate in Colombia is a, um, uh, a, a, a very highly regarded school of journalism that turns out large numbers of uh, um, bio journalism graduates and, and quite a thriving local media with two locally owned daily newspapers, uh, locally um, or, or a local radio network of multiple stations that focus on many local issues and several local TV uh, network affiliates. Um, so uh, we have good access to the media and um, another lesson learned, I think, um, as you develop your campaign is to get to know the journalists who are interested in this issue. If your um, local paper has a city reporter who typically reports on um, city government issues, get to that person, um, touch base with them regularly. When you have something new to announce, uh, let them know it and just try to get them on your side to report the news the way that you would most like it to be reported. That way, that will influence other people who the newspaper. Um, local uh, talk shows very often would like uh, to have local stories to report. So make yourself available to go and, you know, during the morning talk show and talk with that radio host about something that you think is important in the community. So his, you know, five or 10 or 20,000 listeners uh, 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 get to hear that. And um, when people hear the similar messages over and over again, you can really build a buzz about a particular topic. Now, the slide that's on the screen shows a um, an editorial that was written by uh, the public editor of our paper towards the campaign. The date is on there, 6th of February 2004. At a time at which the debate had really become quite a focus in the community throughout the media. Um, and we had maybe been somewhat uh, neglectful in, uh, or negligent in um, not engaging Mr. Waters, his name is Hank Waters, uh, at an earlier stage in the campaign because he wrote this and was pretty lukewarm about, about the whole idea. And Jake concluded that it seemed like a nice idea, but it's going to cost an awful lot of money and really uh, pr- probably not something that the community should do. Um, 
this editorial that he published on the 6th of February. Um, a group of us, three of us, went to visit him in his office by appointment. He was very, very, very um, welcoming to that idea. He's pretty open and wants to know what people in the community think. And we took a um, PowerPoint presentation with about 100 slides um, that we had photographed mainly in places like Boulder, Colorado, Davis, California, Madison, Wisconsin, Port Oregon, Santa Barbara, California, some of the uh, cities that really got ahead in the um, 80s, 90s, uh, building more multimodal streets and um, creating better access for all modes. And we'd used this presentation numerous times throughout the community with private groups, with um, at, even at some of the public meetings uh, to, to try to make our point. Um, and um, he, he watched this and he understood the vision that we had for Columbia. And about uh, a week or so after we went to visit him, he uh, told me editorial, this is February the 24th, 2004, Street Standards, let's go to a new approach. And extremely enthusiastic and visionary there and, and really pushed the city uh, for his position as the local um, newspaper owner to, uh, to, to take this step. It would be a good thing to do. So a great example of, of that. Shortly after that, the um, new uh, policy was indeed passed. And uh, as a result now, uh, the two photographs show the same location, a uh, bridge over a creek that back in 2000 with a two-lane road with absolutely no accommodation for pedestrians or cyclists. A uh, road was slated to be widened, uh, approved uh, anyway, but because of the street design standards, which required that not only new streets, but also streets undergoing major renovation would have to accommodate pedestrians and cyclists and shares. Uh, we have the uh, the larger picture there showing uh, that uh, crossing East Broadway in Columbia over the Hinkson Creek. Uh, I'm going to timeline now just to kind of give some more of the mechanics of it, and I've got a little anecdote just to finish up with. Um, but this will give you an idea of how long this took, and hopefully your campaigns won't take long. There's a lot more awareness of the benefits of complete street now, just as Paul discussed his presentation. And, and you're not necessarily introducing what some people think is a completely foreign idea. Um, the the Penn Coalition was formed in 2000, and, and during the, that remainder of 2000, we worked on individual street projects as they came up with and attempted to change the designs and were minimally successful. Um, in the middle of 2001, um, working with some allies in the city of Columbia, particularly in the planning department, um, realized that the, the goal should be to change the policy, the street design standards policy that defines how streets are built, so that it becomes the default. And um, uh, an initial meeting of interested parties was called. It was very, very open and very, very diverse. It involved uh, some members of the city staff, particularly from the planning department, members of our advocacy organization, and included one or two elected officials, including the mayor of the city, Mayor Darwin Heinzman, typically uh, made this a, um, a, a major political objective of his. It included some academics working uh, at the University of Missouri in Columbia, working uh, in traffic engineering um, and transportation issues. Uh, there was a lot of um, ordinary citizens who wanted to, um, you know, have more accessible streets for their kids to walk to school or for themselves to bike and, and kind of thing. And uh, disabilities advocates were a very important part as well. Uh, and, and that group was an entirely unofficial uh, group that was just formed. Uh, it did meet in a city building because the, the city planning department was kind of the host, um, but it didn't have any formal role in city government policy. However, over a process of about a year, the group met about once a month and gradually formed a vision for what a, a street design standard uh, might look like. At the same time, more and more members of the city council and planning and zoning committee Commission became engaged through lobbying and, and through attending these meetings. And in the middle of 2002, um, the City Council gave an official directive to uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission to see this issue and to form an official Street Design Standards Advisory Committee to study the issue and make formal recommendations to the Commission and to the City Council. Um, at this point, this official body was formed, and one of the interesting things was it had many of the same people that had already been meeting for a year, 
official capacity, kind of continued it work, its work, but it now had an institutional mandate. Um, the work became much more organized now um, because staff were formally assigned time to support the work of this committee and do research um, and, and um, develop uh, uh, formal language, much along the lines of the street design style, the, the complete streets policies that Sarah had talked about and how this would actually uh, connect with existing city policy and replace certain parts of that policy. By the end of 2003, the advisory committee had completed its work and the public hearing process started. And this was the point at which um, opponents to campaign became uh, more vocal and where that media advocacy uh, that I referred to with the two stories in the newspaper was so helpful. Uh, certain interests, mainly big business interests in the city, as well as um, developers and um, some of the uh, um, staff members in the city's public works department who were accustomed to building streets for cars but didn't see value of opening them up to um, non-motorized transportation uh, became vocal opponents of this effort and it became a, um, a, a public hearing um, battle between the different parties. Um, for the people making the decision, the, the zoning commissioners and the, um, and the council members were very engaged in the benefits of this. There was generally overwhelming support for the idea of a complete streets policy. And uh, after about another year of uh, public debate, um, the uh, new ordinance was adopted. And uh, one of my favorite um, slides on this is, is this one, which was the uh, newspaper's editorial uh, cartoon the day after the street standards ordinance was adopted. One of the features of it was that sidewalks, there had been an ordinance requiring four-foot sidewalks on certain residential streets. This was expanded to talk about five-foot sidewalks or eight-foot sidewalks on, on um, and some kind of a sidewalk on every street. So this was the cartoonist's take on, on, on all of that. Um, sorry, just, uh, for my... Uh, so my, my final anecdote, then, just to finish up with, I'm sure I'm out of time. Um, the um, policy really well accepted by the community. Uh, and again, there has been some uh, discussion uh, sometimes among candidates running for council or existing council members that they may be costing the city too much or it's a waste of uh, public resources and we should get back to just building roads for cars. But honestly, the community really embraces is the street line standards. And uh, I think this was made most evident just very recently in uh, November of last year, just two months ago, uh, when a new um, extension of a major highway going through town uh, was open, Providence Road. Um, and um, the uh, reporter who did his research very well um, reported, and I pulled out a couple of paragraphs here. The first one uh, just uh, kind of gives the factual uh, report that the extension conducted in, a, in, in accordance with the pedestrian-friendly street design standards the City of Columbia Council passed in 2004 includes five-foot sidewalk on one side, an eight-foot pedway, which is a mixed-use path for cyclists and pedestrians, on the other side, as well as bike lanes. And they wait to see. But I really like the, um, the, the next one. Uh, they quoted uh, Stuart King, who is an engineer with the Public Works Department. The Public Works Department had strongly opposed uh, the effort in 2004, but he said it can neighborhoods a lot we're doing with the trail connection and the coordination. It's a full multimodal transportation project. So we were very pleased to see that the uh, Public Works Department now does embrace and, and indeed um, brag about what a great uh, transportation project they're doing. So with that, I will uh, finish my presentation and hand back to Christine. Thank you. I love that quote at the end. That's perfect. So let me transition this over. The final presentation um, that we'll have before we uh, get to your questions is from Stephanie Stevens, the staff attorney with NPLAN. And she's just going to um, quickly talk to you a little bit about other resources that are available through NPLAN and our technical assistance work. Uh, and just a reminder, if you have any lingering questions, uh, please submit them in the Q&A box, and we'll try to get, get to as many as possible right at the end. Okay. Okay, one. 
and I guess good afternoon to some of you. I'm just going to briefly go over Implan's legal technical assistance work. My goal is to entice you to go to our website and really check out these policies for yourself because I'm not going to have a lot of time to go into a whole lot of detail, um, but I just want to call your attention to the work that we're doing here. So we have seen communities that look like this. We've got fast food everywhere, convenience stores, it's really wide streets, no bike lanes. It's a very uninviting landscape. And this is really not the picture of a healthy community. Our goal at Implan is to really change that. Our mission is to provide legal technical assistance for the childhood obesity prevention movement with the goal of reversing childhood obesity by 2050. Do that in three ways. Provide um, legal research, and the research is really the foundation of our work. I um, want to ensure that our tools are grounded not only in the available scientific data, but also in the law, and that is making sure that it's legally possible to actually implement um, the policies that we produce. So we do in-house research, and we also do a lot of partnering with experts in fields that produce little memos, parts like um, this 50-state scan that you see on the slide here, and also um, white papers, and those are uh, available on our website. The kinds of technical assistance that we provide, um, Sarah talked about earlier in her presentation, and those are model policies, and um, they range from model ordinances, resolutions, um, to model agreements like joint use agreements, zoning language, things of that nature. I mentioned, you know, these are really living documents, so we're constantly um, honing and revising these based on the feedback that we get back um, from advocates in the field. The kind of um, technical events we provide is what you're experiencing right now, where we do, um, you know, broader trainings, webinars. We travel to conferences around the country um, throughout the year. Some of you may have even been at some of those conferences. And we also do one-on-one um, -on -one technical assistance. So if folks have questions, they can email us to so give us a call and we can um, respond appropriately. So we're really quickly going to go through um, some of the uh, topics that we cover, some of our policies. We have um, model comprehensive plan language and a model ordinance that is designed to protect existing and um, help establish new farmers markets, which is a way, great way to increase um, food access in communities. Along the lines, um, we have model comprehensive plan language to again, help to sustain existing community gardens and also help to establish new community gardens. We uh, recently put out a um, school food zone ordinance, and this is designed um, so that fast food restaurants will be prohibited from locating within a specified proximity of schools, and so the idea that we want the areas where kids are most likely to be to be you know, healthy um, food retail environments, and this really helps to support the national school lunch program as well. We um, recently developed a um, produce cart ordinance, taking a page um, from the strategy book of the New York City Health Department, and um, they're we're not sure if that's on our website quite yet, but if it's not, it should be really soon. Um, and this creates incentives for vendors selling fresh, whole fruits and veggies uh, with an option to focus on communities uh, most in need. We all recently um, did a model local obesity prevention resolution. This is um, for cities and counties that want to take an internal approach to really set the tone for obesity prevention and wellness. It includes provisions like creating a task force to look at disparities in obesity rates among communities of color, creates an employee wellness program for municipal employees, and supports schools' effort to implement joint use agreements, and that's coming very soon to our website. A whole suite of products dedicated to joint use agreements, um, four model joint use agreements ranging from, you know, very, very simple to more complex. 
And what joint use agreements do is allow school districts to partner with local government and share the responsibility when opening up school facilities for community use during non-school hours, which is a great way to really increase um, opportunities for physical activity in neighborhoods. A whole host of model policies um, available on our website, child care physical activity standards, we have a model menu labeling ordinance, and we're constantly developing new policies as we get feedback from the um, advocacy community about what their priorities are. This site, when you go to um, www.implan.org, this is what you'll see. There's a search box there on the right-hand side. You can you know, click on one of those boxes or just type in what you're looking for. We hope that you'll take a look at our website and if you happen to download something and, and put it to use, we'd love to hear how that works for you. If you have any suggestions for us, like I mentioned, you know, these are living documents, so we'd love to hear if you think that we can make them better or if you have just any ideas for other policies that we might um, work on. So with thank you very much, and I'll it back to Christine. All right. Thank you, Stephanie. Very flexible and helps us <laughs> stay on time. Um, so uh, now we'll get to your questions. Um, so the first, and I'm going to mute actually our panelists now just so that they're available to talk as soon as it's good. Um, the first question that I'll field it goes to Sarah. Um, I had uh, one person from a community has a complete streets resolution on the books, but um, it doesn't, it isn't leading to real change. So this person was wondering how you go from a resolution to a stronger policy. So I'd say that there's two things that you probably want to think about in, in that kind of situation. The first is that you may want to do some more relationship building and some more kind of education and training work with the the officials and agencies in in your community. So you may want to meet with some of the transportation engineers and talk to them about your concerns. And, um, and maybe host some trainings or talks with some experts in this area and see if you get them to come attend. So it's kind of changing how they think about what. Additionally, in terms of more legal steps, I think that you don't have to feel discouraged about the fact that a resolution has been passed and you're, it's, you're slow to see change. For maybe seeing slow incremental change starting, or you, the resolution may really have served as a way of bringing this issue to people's attention, having something to refer them to that says, look, this is a priority of our community, and you may now want to start advocating for a law, like one of the um, model laws that we we have available, or um, or think about that comprehensive plan language that we talked about, which are other ways of really trying to make these requirements more specific and and make sure that they're implemented more rigorously. Um, then, before we get to the next question, um, there are, lots of people are submitting pretty technical questions about complete streets, and we encourage you uh, after the webinar, if you'd like those questions answered, um, to contact us. Um, and, and we'll either answer the question or make sure that um, you have an answer to it. So um, the next question I'll send out to Paul and Ian. Um, one person uh, was concerned about uh, bringing these complete streets ideas, um, which may be pretty new to some planned transportation officials in different communities. Um, what are some good ways to approach them with these ideas and really get them on board um, with uh, encouraging uh, all users um, in the design. Uh, Paul, I shall, I'll start and have Ian at, uh, join in. Um, wh what I'd say is that my experience uh, increasingly, at least in the last 10 years, and I've been doing this for close to 20 years now, is that uh, transportation professionals, traffic engineers, and others are becoming more open to these concepts. And I'm not exactly sure. I think it's a result of the change in, in funding. Uh, in, in the way funding is done at the national level, the fact that there is more funding and there has been more funding since the early 90s for 
uh, bicycle and pedestrian products, although still not nearly enough, as I pointed out. Uh, but there has been that shift. And there's also been more emphasis in the education and training of traffic engineers and in their profession on issues like traffic calming, where we try to get the speeds down and try to make streets more, more comfortable for bicyclists. So in general, I'd say um, I think there's a greater receptivity to this. I think education is going to be key. I think working with policymakers and having an advocacy group like Ian described that's pressure on uh, is going to be critical. So I think that it's a combination of things, not one and not any one thing. But on the plus side, on the, on the positive side, I'm seeing more and more examples of, of communities where the traffic engineers now are, are supporters and champions. Yeah, I agree with uh, all of those points, Paul. Um, I, I'll mention a couple of specific examples that we utilized that I think were helpful. I'm fortunate to have an Active Living by Design grant uh, from Robert Wood Johnson uh, awarded uh, to our community at about a halfway point of this campaign, and was actually able to uh, provide essentially some staff time to work on the campaign. The other thing we set up with that grant was what we called the Active Living Partnership. This was a very broad partnership of uh, agencies, government agencies, and private uh, agencies across the community. Uh, and it was a very uh, non-threatening um, uh, goal for the Active Living Partnership, really just to increase physical activity in the community and look at ways to make a more supportive community for being physically active. Um, and the Public Works Department was one of our partners, um, as were numerous other city departments, university departments, the public schools, uh, nonprofit groups and businesses. Um, we set up a system every year of presenting awards to three or four members or organizational members of our partnership for work that they had done. And we were able to um, present an award to our traffic engineer for so some of his, um, you know, willingness to take our concerns about street standards uh, up the chain in his department and uh, really uh, kind of make a, um, a model of him uh, uh, as, as a, um, an active living leader in our community in working on these issues. Another thing with actually the same, the same gentleman, traffic engineer, uh, he was a recreational cyclist, uh, but he didn't really... Uh, ride his bike for transportation at all, so uh, he had a hard time seeing the uh, complete streets debate from the same point of view that we saw it. Uh, we did convince him, uh, he enjoyed riding his bike, to take the League of American Bicyclists um, road, road One course, or we called it Confidence City Cycling. Um, and uh, once he took that course, he completely changed his attitude to street standards because he became a cyclist on roads with traffic, which was something he had previously not believed that he could do. So if you have league certified instructors in your community, or if you would be interested in hosting a, um, a, 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 an LCI uh, seminar in which um, a league uh, um, trainer would come and take individuals through the instructor training so that you have people in your community who can teach this class as to how to ride safely and and, and cooperatively with traffic, then you can get some of your your policymakers, your opponents, if you can, to take this class. Honestly, it opens people's eyes. Great, thank you. Um, next question: um, In a community where homeowners are responsible for the upkeep of sidewalks on their property, what are the liability issues the munis municipality would have? Um, and this particular community, they were told that they couldn't promote walking um, because they might, the municipality might be held liable. So I'm going to send that to Sarah. Um, to me, this sounds like a real red herring. Like your yep. community, your municipality is really trying to throw you off. Um, and I would strongly advise that you try and track down a local attorney who can help you really assess if there's any, any. Um, um, validity to this concern. We have certainly experienced that with all of the policies that we've developed in our promoting, that liability frequently comes up as a concern. And oftentimes it's, it's used in an attempt to just kind of stop the conversation and shut down the discussion rather than um, being seen as one consideration and something that can be managed um, by use of, of established risk assessment techniques. Um, 
Um, I have to say that liability simply is not that much of a concern for communities when it comes to complaint streets as a general matter, and that's because most cities are already doing this kind of thing. Uh, and in fact, there's potentially more liability if people are getting injured because there's lack of safe um, bicycle routes or sidewalks for people. Um, so I'll kind of close it down there. There's certainly more that can be said about liability, but I don't think that you should um, let the city just throw that word out there and, and try and stop the conversation that way. Okay. Um, so one final question to Paul about resources. Um, if folks want to see all of the different complete streets policies that have been adopted, where can they go? Yes, and I posted that, I guess, in response to some of the questions I've gotten. gotten seen, and that would be the uh, National Complete Streets uh, Coalition's website, uh, www.completestreets.org, and they have a map that shows uh, all of the um, locations that have adopted both city, states, um, and regions, and uh, you can also get a listing of those as well. Thank you. So we are out of time. Um, but I just want to remind everyone that um, NPLAN will also have resources on Complete Streets available in the next three to four weeks, and we will send you an email when those are available. Um, in the meantime, tomorrow you can go to our website and access a recording of this webinar to share with your colleagues um, and uh, the PDFs of the slides um, that were presented. Um, we have this bi-monthly webinar series. We actually have one next month, so we're a little out of order there, um, that will be covering uh, getting fresh local foods into underserved communities through farmers market and produce cart policies. So um, check our website next week and you'll be able to register for that one. Thanks so much to all of our presenters um, and have a great day.